Hi, everybody. If you want to join us, um, we're going to be starting the last plenary session of the conference. My name is Jen Levy. I'm the scientific director at Coalition to Cure Calpain 3. Um, and this last session is all about the development of new treatments and new assessments. So earlier today, you heard about the clinical trials that are um, being initiated and ongoing. Now we're going to look at some uh, much earlier technologies, things that are still being uh, developed and tested in models such as cell models or animal models. Um, these we're still figuring out what's the best design, what's the right dose, is it effective and is it safe? And until there's a good idea about all these things, um, they're not ready to be tested in people yet. Um, so really exciting new stuff and hopefully at a future conference they'll be in the clinical trial session instead. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We have two live speakers and then two pre-recorded speakers. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Peter Kang at the University of Minnesota, and he's going to talk about developing cell therapies for muscular dystrophies. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I do want to thank all the organizers of this conference. It's been an amazing experience. And also to Catherine Bryant Knudsen, um, I hope she's online. Um, we miss you here, and and uh, we appreciate all the work you've done, and all the people here have been amazing. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about cell therapy and try to put it in context. So these are my disclosures. They're not relevant to the uh, subject of today's discussion. Um, to put things in a little bit more context, I'll, uh, before I get to the cell therapy I'll, I'll, for muscular dystrophy, I'll uh, kind of discuss some of the background material. So uh, if we kind of zoom out and take a look more broadly, um, as you know for limb girdle muscular dystrophies, and you've seen either this diagram or similar diagrams the past couple of days, there are a lot of genes a lot, and a lot of proteins, and they're expressed in different parts of the muscle fiber. Some of them are outside the muscle fiber. And so there's a lot to tackle, and, uh, and it would be nice to come up with an approach that could be applicable to multiple subtypes in an ideal situation. And that's what we'd like to do with the cell therapy. So these are some of the broad categories, and this is an overgeneralization, but if you look at the different types of therapies out there, and this doesn't include devices and things, so it's just zooming in on, um, on drugs and biologics. Um, for many decades, most of the drugs out there were drugs, uh, meaning small molecules, and these are small bio biochemical compounds. They often bind to receptors of various kinds, although that's not the uh, uniform mechanism. That's often how they work. Um, you can, one nice thing about these, you can usually package them as a pill and take them by mouth. Sometimes they do have to be taken IV, but a lot of them are by mouth. Uh, and they're taken at least once a day, sometimes twice a day. And an example that's, uh, and I only want to cite approved examples, is Rizdaplam for SMA. And so uh, small molecules do, do still play a role in new therapies today, so we shouldn't forget about them. And then they're antisense oligonucleotides. They're short strands of DNA that bind to pre-mRNA. They're usually given intravenously, but you have to take, get the intravenous dose pretty often, sometimes once a week. And so there are multiple products approved for both spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is really exciting. And then there's gene therapy, which we've heard a lot about the last uh, couple of days. And this is DNA packaged in viruses. They enter cells and deliver DNA. Um, usually they're delivered intravenously. Sometimes they're target injections. And uh, as we've heard, uh, at this time, you can only get a, one dose. Hopefully, that'll change in the future. And we've got products approved for both SMA and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, and there are several in the pipeline for limb girdle dystrophy, as we've heard. And for cell therapy, there's nothing approved for neuromuscular diseases at this time, although, as I'll describe, there are stem cell therapies for other diseases that are approved or in the works. Um, and these are either stem cells or stem cell derivatives, and they generate healthy cells. And they're usually given by intravenous uh, or targeted injections, and they're usually only given once. Uh, there are sometimes the possibilities of doing repeat doses. So let's look at other diseases. What's been going on? Because if you think about stem cell therapy more broadly, it's been around for a long time, going back to the 1950s. So... Um, in the 1950s, there, uh, bone marrow transplants began to be used, and so the first one, 
the first ones were done f between identical twins. You had a donor who was a twin and an identical twin who was the recipient. And then, um, and then in the 1960s, um, at the University of Minnesota, uh, there was the first non-twin sibling donor uh, recipient pair, and this bone marrow transplant was performed in 1968. So this kind of idea of using cells to heal diseases has been around for a while and has been used successfully in other settings. And then more recently, uh, a lot of you have heard about CAR T cell therapy. This has really revolutionized, revolutionized cancer care for, in a lot of cases. Um, and this began in the 2010s, and now it's become pretty widespread in terms of its use. Well, what about muscular dystrophy? We have been looking at cell therapy for muscular dystrophy for a while, it turns out. And these are studies that were largely published in the 1990s. After the genes started to be discovered for muscular dystrophy, people started thinking, well, we can pr try to put healthy cells back in. So these were what we call myoblasts, and they, these are post-mitotic cells, meaning that they've more or less um, are not dividing actively the way stem cells do. And these were uh, transplanted into patients, and unfortunately, they didn't show therapeutic effect, and these were largely done on Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients. So there were actually human clinical trials, but they were kind of disappointing, and that's why things sort of tapered off after the 1990s. Um, but in the meantime, between the 1990s and today, there's been a lot of animal work. And if you go back, you'll see that there's uh, dozens of uh, fairly important papers published on different things, such as how do we deliver them, what kind of cells are the best, uh, et cetera, including studies on models of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And we're hoping that uh, because of the work of a collaborator of mine uh, that we'll be able to start a cell therapy trial, at least for Duchenne muscular dystrophy in the near future. And, uh, and we do have some preclinical data on limb girdle muscular dystrophy also. Uh, we're just starting with Duchenne muscular dystrophy because that's where we have the most preclinical data and the most mouse data. So uh, the, the, um, the the background of the approach is what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. And as you may recall from 10, 20 years ago, there's a lot of controversy about using embryonic stem cells to treat human disease. And so a discovery made enabled us to sidestep that entire ethical question. So in 2006, uh, a group in Japan published a paper um, showing how you can take just regular cells, sometimes skin cells or blood cells, um, and just convert them into stem cells. And all you need to do is express these four protein transcription factors, and they're listed here on the slide. And they've been, become known as the Yamanaka factors after the senior author of that paper. Um, and this led to a Nobel Prize in 2012. So for those of you who remember this discovery, this uh, led to a flurry of activity. People were really looking into whether you can use iPSCs, as we call them, um, to treat human disease. Um, and it turns out, at least for the first decade, they've been most useful for modeling human disease and generating data, um, but not necessarily putting right into humans because of a lot of concerns about these are stem cells. If we can't control their proliferation, there's a risk of tumors forming. So that's one of the underlying dangers we always worry about with stem cells. Um, so these are some of the problems that um, my collaborator, Rita Perlingero, um, has been working on uh, preclinically, and I've stepped in kind of at a later stage to help translate this into the clinic. So we want to differentiate iPSCs into a cell type that's needed. In th this case, it's biogenic presenter cells. We want to culture them in media that's compatible with human clinical use. You don't want the culture media to be something that's not something humans can tolerate because no matter how much you try to purify the cells, there, there'll be some residual um, of it left over. And you do, one of the big safety concerns is trying to make sure that they're not liable to generating tumors. Um, and then there's the immune issue that you've heard about for gene therapy. That's also an issue for cell therapy. You want to minimize immune reactions. Um, we want to see if the cells are actually engrafting where we want them to be. Um, targeting skeletal muscle has turned out to be a really difficult problem for cell therapy. And then you want to see if the cells can survive and thrive for long periods of time after transplantation. We are transplanting live cells, and we want them to actually survive for as long as possible once they're there. And so this is the work that, um, that Rita Perlingero has done for over a decade in her laboratory, and uh, she's um, figured out how to take in pluripotent stem cells, convert them into myogenic progenitors, 
and she's been injecting them, uh, her lab's been injecting them into uh, various models of, um, of muscular dystrophy for quite a long time. So most of the data is on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but she's also worked on Calpain and FKRP. Um, so there's data on that as well. It's just not as far along as with the Duchenne data. Um, and so she's um, generated donor-derived myofibers, meaning that the stem cells or stem cell derivatives that she's injected has generated muscle fibers. Um, there's been enhancement in contractile properties, and we see muscle stem cells uh, coming out. And then we see engraftment, meaning those cells are actually living inside the muscle now. Um, one of the uh, big questions in cell transplants is, do we do allogeneic or autologous? And so for genetic diseases, it's an especially tricky problem because uh, with allogeneic, um, you, you take a donor that's unrelated typically to the recipient, and you have to make sure it's a transplant that's compatible, but then you could treat potentially a lot of different recipients. Autologous typically means you're treating yourself, you're taking cells out, doing something to them to help the cells heal, and then put them back into the same individual. So the donor and the recipient are actually the same person. So cell therapies have used both approaches, and there are pluses and minuses of both. So if you look, this is just a schematic illustrating um, on the right side, you have an individual with uh, muscular dystrophy, and you take, stem uh, take cells out, reprogram them, and then treat them, and then you can transplant them back in. And the approach that we're taking right now is, uh, let me see if it shows up, uh, there we go, um, is the allogeneic route where we're taking a healthy donor, and this is actually from a cell bank um, from the NIH, um, and the somatic cells were converted into iPSCs, as we call them, and then we differentiate them into healthy myogenic progenitors, and then we try to inject them into uh, back, uh, not back, but into um, an individual with muscular dystrophy. So, um, so Rita Perlingero's lab has taken many of the steps uh, towards clinical translation. So as you can see, there's a lot that goes into uh, preparing for an um, FDA submission. And so there's a methodology for um, the cell product, uh, purifying it. Um, GMP um, is uh, a requirement for uh, generating cells that are safe to put into humans. Um, you want to scale it up so that you can actually do this for more than one dose and characterize the cell product. Uh, you have to do uh, manufacture these in a clinical grade facility. Um, there are some lentiviral vectors that are required to uh, do some of the genetic modifications. So there is actually, in a matter of speaking, some gen gene therapy that's being done to the cells. Um, but it's not what we traditionally think of as gene therapy. And then production-grade cell product, um, preclinical studies, and then the IND filing with the FDA. So we're very close to the end of this road, but then this opens up a whole other road, as you've seen with other um, uh, therapies that are further down the pipeline, that the clinical trials entail multiple steps as well. So that just goes on to the next phase. I'm just trying to advance. Hmm. This one's not advancing. I think I'm close to the end anyway, but... So let's see if, huh, oh, there we go, oops. Okay, and this just kind of is a schematic that shows how far we've come, and, um, but yeah, once we do the first in-human clinical trial, we'll have multiple phases of clinical trials uh, coming up in the future. So we're not, um, we wish uh, that it was a little faster at this point, but things will accelerate once we start our first clinical trial. Um, so what we're planning to do for our phase one is to do individual muscle injections in the foot. And this is a phase one study, so we're looking at feasibility and safety. Um, and the initial study will be on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But as I mentioned, uh, we're starting to accumulate more data on limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And the nice thing about this approach is that once we start validating it, it becomes easier to apply it to other muscular dystrophies. And these are some of the colleagues who've been working um, on this. Uh, and Rita Perlingero, whose data I've shown, is up on the upper left. And there are uh, multiple people who've been working on this over the years. And uh, we're optimistic that uh, we will be bringing this to patients, hopefully, in the near future. And this is our um, Muscular Dystrophy Center team. Um, and we're going to be involving them more and more as we begin moving towards the clinic, um, and then our clinic team as well. Um, and then for those of you who, um, on a side note, have been participating in our project on undiagnosed LGMDs, thank you for participating. I know a number of you have come by um, to sign up and donate saliva samples. 
So, um, so it's, um, I think we might have time for one or two other participants um, before the end of the conference. You can always contact us afterwards because we can do remote enrollments if, uh, if for some reason we missed you and you're interested. Uh, and then this is um, my uh, people in my laboratory, and two of them are here at the conference, Audrey and Seth, who uh, uh, some of you may have met. And so thank you again for those who have participated. And, uh, and we've had a lot of support over the years for our various research projects, so we're grateful for all the support. So I want to thank, oops, sorry, this is the next presentation. I'll back up a little bit. So, um, but yeah, thank you very much. And again, I, I really want to thank the conference organizers. This has been a fabulous experience. Thank you, Dr. Kang. Our next speaker is Dr. Doriana Sand. Dona from the University of Padova. Um, she's going to talk about chaperone compounds for rescue of missent sarcoglycan mutations. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to be here today, and I would like to thank the organizer and the Speak Foundation for the kind invitation that give me as the, the possibility to describe our story concerning the use of CFTR correctors in sarcoglycanopathies. Because we are focusing on sarcoglycanopathies, I don't want to tell nothing about the diagnosis or the symptoms, but I would like just to underline that these are the 15, 20% of all limb girdle muscular dystrophies and are the most severe forms. There are many different mutations uh, that uh, are present on the sarcoglycan genes. And uh, this, even though there is a, a very uh, tremendous step forward in, in the uh, gene therapy treatment for sarcoglycanopathy, however, we have to do that in this moment, we don't have an effective cure available. So let me tell you something about the, about the mutations. So this in, on your uh, left is the situation that is present in the healthy subject, where you can see that there is the sarcoglycan complex that is at the level of the sarcolemma, and uh, where it exerts a very fundamental structural uh, uh, role in protecting sarcolemma from muscle damage due to muscle contraction. However, you know that we can have uh, examples of sarcoglycanopathies in which we don't see any traces of the, sarcole uh, of the sarcoglycan complex. So there is the absence. And this is mainly due to large gene deletion, insertion, or even small mutation that, however, disrupt the sarcoglycan protein with the mutation and also the entire complex. But there are even other, many other uh, cases in which we can uh, have a small mutation, a missense mutation that leads to the generation of a protein that is not properly folded, as you will see in a while. And this result in a strong reduction of the sarcoglycan complex at the sarcolemma. What happens? This is the normal route of sarcoglycan. So they are uh, produced, folded, they can reach the proper folding at the level of the endoplasmic reticulum, they form the complex, and then they move toward the sarcolemma. But when we have a small mutation, like the missense mutation, the protein is unable to gain the proper folding. So is folding defective, and therefore it is delivered to a very complex pathway that I don't want to describe, but at the end we have uh, the degradation of the protein. And so, uh, but, but a small amount of the protein can skip this uh, degradation and can reach in a very low amount the sarcolemma. So our question is, can we revert this route? In other words, can we help the endogenous, even though mutated protein, to gain a, a 
native light conformation. And so it can escape the degradation, can form the complex, and reach the sarcolemma in higher amount. The answer is coming from uh, another disease, that is the cystic fibrosis. You know that also in this case there are uh, a protein, that is the CFTR proteins, that can have a huge number of different mutations. But some of these mutations are like the one that I described for sarcoglycan. So the protein is unable to properly fold. But in the case of uh, cystic fibrosis, there are also a number of small molecules that, that can correct the protein, allowing the protein to gain a native or native-like conformation. These compounds are called CFTR correctors. So we asked the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to test the small molecule in sarcoglycanopathy. And this is the list of the first uh, small molecule that we tested. In which way? We started uh, with uh, a cell model. So HAC293 cells that are, has nothing to do with the skeletal muscle, but they are human cells. And you can see on your left that if we allow these cells to produce the alpha sarcoglycan, in this case, wild type, you can see that the protein is able to reach the plasma membrane, whereas if we introduce the mutated form, in this case, uh, this is the R98H alpha sarcoglycan mutant, you can see that there are just traces of the sarcoglycan on the plasma membrane. However, if we treat with different uh, CFTR correctors, you can observe a robust relocalization of the protein at the level of the plasma membrane. But of course, this is a model. And uh, fortunately, we had the possibility to use cells coming from patients with sarcoglycanopathy. So by the small bioptic fragment, we were able to produce the myogenic uh, cells that we can differentiate into myotubes. And here you can see that if we look at the myotubes from an LGMD 2D patient with the two mutations that you can read there, we are in the situation in which we have traces of the sarcoglycan complex at the plasma membrane, at the sarcolemma. But if we treat with CFTR correctors, and in this case I would like to show you the example of C17, you can observe that there is a high amount of the sarcoglycan complex. You, here you can see alpha and delta, but we check all the sarcoglycan complex at the level of the sarcolemma. We did the same also with uh, myotubes coming from an LGMD2E patient. And again, you can see the uh, um, relocalization of the sarcoglycan complex at the level of the sarcolemma. So just to do a very long story short, I would like to tell you that among the many CFTR correctors that we tested, at the end, we identify corrector C17 as our lead compound. And so the next step was to test the compound in, in vivo, in animal model. But which kind of animal model? Uh, you know, there is a very well uh, animal model mimicking the uh, alpha sarcoglycanopathy, that is the knockout animal model. But in this case, we don't have any sarcoglycans to recover by our strategy. And therefore, we exploited this animal in such a way that we introduce at the level of the hind limbs of the animal, the uh, human alpha sarcoglycan sequence, either in the wild type form or in the mutated one. And this, again, is the, the example of the R98H uh, sequence. And again, you can see here that we have traces of the sarcoglycan complex at the uh, sarcolima. Uh, and we have a poor muscle strength of the, of the uh, hind limbs. These animals were uh, used to test uh, in vivo uh, the uh, C17 correctors. We did uh, a lot of experiment in which we uh, chronically treated for three weeks, for five weeks by uh, doing uh, 
daily administration of the compound. And uh, again, I would like to show you just one example, that is uh, the, this one that is not yet published, whereas the other you can find data in the paper of Scano. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we treated the animal for five weeks with an intraperitoneal injection every 48 hours. At the end of the treatment, the animal is analyzed for the uh, force elicited by the um, electrical stimulation of the nerves uh, that uh, uh, control the tibialis anterior muscle, and then we can sacrifice the animal and analyze at the molecular level. And here you can see that if uh, we uh, analyze uh, uh, the muscle coming from mice uh, treated with vehicle, you can see that uh, the force uh, elicited by the stimulation is more or less the, like the one of the alpha sarcoglycan knockout animal. However, if we treat uh, with uh, C17, so the blue bar, you can see that there is an increase of the force uh, uh, of the muscle that is not statistically different from the one of the wild type. And this is because indeed we were able to rescue at the level of the sarcolemma our sarcoglycan complex. And this means that even though in the sarcolemma there is a mutated subunit of the complex, this is still functional. And by the way, we also measured the CK of this animal, and we observed that there is a reduction of the CK level in the uh, serum. Um, okay, so we are really very happy about these uh, uh, experiments, this data, but we are also very uh, well aware that C17 is not one of the CFTR correctors approved for cystic fibrosis. And so this uh, is more or less a novel chemica chemical entities that, apart the story of discovery screening and proof of concept, needs to do all the other steps before reaching the clinical trials. And so in the last four, um, 18 months, we did uh, the pharmacolo we analyzed the pharmacological profile of these uh, uh, compounds. And uh, first of all, I would like to show you that uh, what, for what concerns the toxicity profile, we have a lot of data coming from the chronic treat treatments of mice. And uh, we can say that we observe no acute adverse event. All treated animals reach the experimental endpoint, no reaction at the site of injection, no effect on the growth of the animal, they gain the same weight, no macro-micro tissue damage at the level of liver, kidneys, heart, and other organs, normal renal filtration, normal count of the uh, red and white and plated uh, cells, uh, hemoglobin content were in the normal range. So, at the end, we can say that uh, even though these, uh, uh, these uh, experiments are non-GLP, they suggest a reasonable safety profile for this compound. For what concerns the uh, pharmacokinetic studies, of course, I don't want to bore you with the many uh, detail of this experiment, but I would like just to tell you that the absorption is, uh, uh, after an acute administration, is uh, compatible with the uh, route of administration, so the intraperitoneal one. Uh, if we perform uh, uh, subsequent uh, administration, uh, you can see that uh, the compound can reach the steady state level after three days of uh, consecutive administration. Uh, for what concerns the distribution, you can see here that uh, all the organs and tissues that we have analyzed uh, are uh, reached by the compound. And if we just to focus on heart and skeletal muscle that are the target tissues for sarcoglycanopathy, you can see that the maximal concentration is reached after two hours from the injection that is the same of the plasma uh, concentration. And, but in uh, these two tissues, uh, you can see that the molecule is stable up to six hours. Then 
as in any other organs, there is a decline on the, con on the concentration of the compounds, and this is because the uh, molecule is metabolized and eliminated. I can say immediately that uh, the metabolism is not occurring in the uh, conventional uh, organs such as liver, kidney, or lung, because we were unable to see metabolites in these uh, tissues. However, we know that in the small intestine, we uh, found four metabolites. Two of them uh, are very uh, hydrophilic, and so they are reabsorbed from the intestine and then are removed through the urine. Whereas in the, the less hydrophilic are removed together with the C17 in the unmodified form through the feces. So to summarize, we have, I think, to have convinced you that we have solid data of C17 efficacy collected both in vitro cells from patients particularly and in vivo using this humanized mouse model. We have also pharmacokinetic data that even though non-GLP are suggestive of a reasonable drug-like properties of the molecule and also safety profile. Furthermore, I would like to remember that C17 is a small molecule, so it can be easily synthesized, optimized, administered, and delivered. We can search for good formulation. And so we believe that C17 is a good candidate to be further developed to treat in a future time sarcoglycanopathies. Here is where we are. We did a lot of work in these last 11 years for the efficacy, proof of concept, uh, and non-GLP toxicology and uh, pharmacokinetic studies. We are still working because, for example, we are doing now experiment uh, um, analyzing how long is the duration of the recovery of the protein of the complex uh, at the sarcolemma. Uh, we are also uh, um, evaluating which is the best route of administration, oral versus parenteral. And we are also thinking to do some possible optimization of the compounds. However, from this point on, on, onward, we need to do a jump. We need to uh, perform GLP, uh, hind enabling uh, toxicity and the pharmacokinetic uh, test to be able to reach the patient as early as possible. And for this reason, we are here today also to ask your help and your advice and, uh, and uh, what you can give us to do this. To conclude, the pharmacological strategy has to be considered a therapeutic solution for sarcoglycanopathies caused by missus mutation, that, by the way, are the majority of the reported case, is complementary to gene therapy, is suitable for combo treatments. We can use two or more uh, correctors or even correctors and other small molecules, and is um, potentially effective for other indications that, of course, should have a similar pathogenic mechanism. This is my disclosure because part of these data are patented. And uh, I would like to thank my group. Uh, Martina is in the audience. I would like to thank Sofia, Leonardo, Bertha, and Roberta that are key collaborators to this study, the former uh, group uh, uh, participant, other uh, collaborators, and of course, who funded this, uh, this story until now. And all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sedona, for sharing these exciting results. Our next um, presentation is virtual. It's by Dr. Michael Molyneux from Vita Therapeutics. And his uh, presentation is called Regenerative Medicine in LGMD 2AR1, 
of VTA100, a novel therapeutic cell-based approach. My name is Mike Molino, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Vita Therapeutics. Vita Therapeutics is a privately held biotech company that's based in Baltimore, Maryland. And at Vita Therapeutics, we're working on harnessing the power of genetics to replace defective muscle cells. Currently at Vita Therapeutics, we're working on a cell and gene-based therapy. We have two platforms. One is what would be called autologous. That means that we would take blood or tissue from the patient who has the condition. We would then alter that blood and tissue to produce cells that would then correct a genetic defect. We would then give those cells back to the patient for a particular condition to be treated. We focus predominantly on replacing and repairing defective muscle cells. The other platform that we're working on is something called allogeneic. That would be uh, corrected muscle cells or tissue from what would be considered a universal line. So it wouldn't be one patient, one treatment. It would be uh, a treatment that could be given to multiple different patients. So it's more broadly applicable to a larger population than an autologous cell line. So an autologous cell line, that particular patient will get their own cells. So if opening up that allogeneic platform would allow us to expand and treat many more subjects with uh, neuromuscular degenerative conditions. Essentially, we're trying to correct the genetic defects that would then lead to a, a functional cellular improvement and then through that, we hope to see functional improvement as well in that patient. Currently, our lead program is something called VTA100. This is an autologous cell product, um, and these are satellite cells, which are precursors to muscle tissue. We use this uh, to treat limb girdle muscular dystrophy, 2A slash 1R. We anticipate filing the IND, that's the initial new drug application, in the first quarter of 2025, and then we would anticipate dosing patients with this condition sometime uh, in the first half of 2025. We also have another product uh, which is close to clinic, which is called VTA120. That's an autologous cell product that we'll use to treat uh, neuromuscular condition called FSHD. We anticipate being in the clinic in that product in the first half of 2026. As I stated before, VITA is focused on neuromuscular diseases uh, and regenerating normal muscle tissue. Um, currently, we're focused on various forms of muscular dystrophy. Um, obviously, folks know that these result in progressive weakness. There's a loss of muscle mass and function over time. And currently, it's very limited in the treatment alternatives and care is mainly supportive. There's about 64,000 subjects or patients in the United States today that have muscular dystrophy conditions. Um, in normal setting, uh, these when you injure the muscle, it will regrow in, in an organized fashion and produce normal muscle tissue. Patients that have various forms of muscular dystrophy, this natural process doesn't occur. So oftentimes with injury or time, that muscle tissue will get replaced with scarring or fibrous tissue or, or uh, fat tissue, and then that impairs the function. As I said, our initial focus is limb girdle muscular dystrophy. That has a particular pattern of involvement of the muscles, as does uh, FSHD, uh, myotonic dystrophy, and distal muscular dystrophy. Currently, there's some work being done in the gene therapy space. Uh, gene therapy is, again, looking at integrating into the patient's muscle tissue and correcting genetic defects. It could require number of treatment over a number of different years. We feel that one of the potential advantages with cell therapy is it could be uh, something that could see significant improvement with single injection or one or two injections. Because it, it's actually, these cells will then be integrated into the patient's own muscle tissue and then on an ongoing basis, uh, pre preparing that muscle uh, because we've replaced the genetic defects that existed in that muscle prior to the therapy. As I mentioned before, normal muscle pattern of growth and regeneration, uh, there's injury or damage. These satellite cells, which are the precursors uh, to forming the muscle tissue, become activated. 
They will then undergo what's called the division. They produce these myoblasts, uh, which are the building blocks of the muscle tissue. And then they will also produce another satellite cell. After the muscle is repaired and they've laid down normal muscular tissue and myofibrils, uh, those cells will then become dormant. So the satellite cells becoming dormant are quiescent as a key uh, to the ongoing normal regeneration or repair of muscle tissue. So that is something that we're demonstrating now with our uh, VTA 100 product for the treatment of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, that the cells will become dormant so that they will be available later on at other times of muscle damage and injury. And then finally, um, you can develop what's called normal muscle fascicle uh, and normal muscle tissue. Our technology was discovered um, by Dr. Kathy Wagner and Dr. Lee, both based at Johns Hopkins University. They were able to take satellite cells and identify them in what's called an, a human pluripotent stem cell cultures. So inducing normal tissue or normal cells to become pluripotent stem cells allows that particular cell to then go on and form many different tissue types. We were mainly identified or interested in identifying satellite cells through their technology where they express uh, something called PAC-7. They were able to identify satellite cells and then extract them from these cultures. And then they've shown that these satellite cells uh, can produce normal myofibrils. Uh, there's some staining slides there on the lower right, which shows that PAC-7 cell with uh, green fluorescent protein staining. And as you can see, it forms this myofibril. Uh, these will then go on to fuse and become normal muscle tissue. The one on the right, it just lacks the fluorescent staining, but you can see the satellite cells in blue uh, are obviously present as well. So this is what's called in vitro testing, where it's test in a tissue culture, not in a living organism. So based on this series of testing, this showed very good promise for the ability to identify satellite cells and then also have satellite cells that could regenerate normal muscle tissue. So the next phase of testing for VITA was to test this in uh, animal models uh, and show that what we thought we were seeing in vitro, we could also see in vivo, vivo meaning the animal model work. So we tested the PAC-7 satellite cells in a mouse model. Um, we induce an injury in a particular muscle in the mice, and then we inject or transplant the satellite cells into that tissue. We then go back one month later and looked at the tissue and we found that the satellite cells that we injected are generating human muscle tissue in these mice. Um, so we were able to identify the satellite cells um, at the basal lamina, which is the base of those fibrils. Um, and then with that, we also were able to demonstrate that these cells appear to be quiescent or dormant as well. So they generated normal muscle and then they became dormant. That was a good sign because that shows that over time with repeat injury or insult, those muscle cells should become reactivated. So the next phase of study was to do it in a, what's called a re-injury model. Um, that's the next slide that I'm showing you now. So this is where we injected the cells. Um, we looked at about five days after the re-injury and we saw that the what were previously dormant or quiescent satellite cells were now becoming active uh, and these satellite cells then led to sustainable regeneration of muscle tissue. So they repair the functional muscle after injury and it led to then a sustainable uh, regeneration of that muscle tissue. So this was something that was a very promising sign uh, for the product and the development. To refine this a little bit more with VTA 100, this is where we're looking at studying the product in something called limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2A or slash 1R. These um, patients have a deficiency of the muscle tissue where they're not able to produce a protein called calpain 3, or if they do produce the protein, it, it, it's not normal functioning. So they're not able to regenerate and repair muscle in a normal fashion. And again, it follows a particular pattern of muscle groups as I illustrated earlier. Um, but by isolating these satellite cells, we are then able to use gene therapy. Uh, so we are able to then 
use gene therapy in the satellite cell. This then allows us to correct this calpain 3 deficiency. So we were able to then produce calpain 3 from the satellite cells. So you're essentially then correcting the, the defect in the subject's own muscle tissue. We take the tissue from the subject in the form of um, blood draws. Um, so we use the patient's own blood. From this, we produce the pluripotent stem cell, the satellite cell, and then we correct the gene defect. So the entire manufacturing process can take anywhere from nine to 12 months. Um, so the majority of the lead time when you're looking at these cell-based therapy studies, cell and gene therapy trials, uh, has a lot to do with the manufacturing lead time that's needed and the fact that it's the, the, the subject's own blood or tissue that we have to use to produce the normal functioning cells. We have a, what's called a pre-IND meeting with the FDA schedule for this quarter, Q4 2023. That's part of the process that you use to help develop your programs. Um, so from that, we'll get feedback on uh, the FDA's uh, expectations for this particular program, how we will study it in human subjects, and then how we will advance the program. So the pre-IND is a very big milestone for the company. Uh, and then we anticipate starting our manufacturing sometime in the first quarter in 2024. We've already identified subjects for the study and then filing the new drug application or the initial new drug application in the first quarter of 2025. And as I mentioned, we should be dosing subjects sometime uh, mid-2025 for this particular trial uh, in limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2A slash 1R. This is our current uh, VTA100 clinical trial protocol. Uh, this is uh, the asset that we will study in limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2A slash R1. This is a two-part study uh, because it's the first in human study. We'll predominantly be looking at safety, but we'll also incorporate other um, aspects into this trial that will also look at efficacy outcomes, mainly functional improvement, imaging improvement via MRI, uh, and then signs of uh, calpain 3 expression and production in the muscle tissue. It's a two-part study. Uh, the, the first part is uh, randomized placebo control. So we'll treat one, either the upper or the lower extremity on one side with VTA100. We'll treat the other side with placebo. If there is no safety concerns uh, and patients are tolerating the, the, the process, at the six-month mark, they'll be eligible to have the previously placebo-treated side treated with VTA100. So subjects that enter the study if there's no safety concerns or issues, would have the expectation that both sides of the body, both upper and lower extremities, would be treated with VTA100. The treatment phase is approximately 12 months, uh, and currently the, the amount of participation we're anticipating to be about 48 months total, including all of the safety follow-up. Some of the key inclusion criteria is genetic confirmation of LGMD2A R1. Um, we're looking for patients with symmetry of the upper and lower extremity because the patient is acting as their own control with one side being treated with drug, the other side being treated with placebo. So that symmetry is very important so that we can tease out uh, efficacy signals much better. Um, and that's the same for both the upper and lower extremity. Currently, it's restricted to adult subjects, male and female, between the ages of 18 and 65. That's very common uh, for first in human trials. Um, and then some of the key metrics that we're measuring, uh, so patients would have to be comfortable undergoing an MRI. It's, it's, there's, not, there's probably three total throughout the entire study, but subjects would have to be comfortable, patients would have to be comfortable undergoing an MRI examination. Um, we do need to use steroids around the time of dosing. Uh, we feel that that's going to help patients tolerate the treatment much better. So uh, the ability to take a steroid or prednisone or prednisolone would be required. We would not uh, want patients that have had prior exposure within the last three months uh, to clinical trials. Um, and then prior gene therapy. Uh, th those are, we eliminate, we, we use those as exclusion basically because again, we want to determine the best effects of the drug um, without patients getting exposed to prior uh, clinical trials. And then again, getting to symmetry of muscles, we're looking at muscles with a fat fraction between a certain percentage 
those are patients that will tend to have, um, um, again, better able to judge between placebo uh, and uh, treatment arm when we're looking for these outcomes such as functional improvement. And um, in general, the protocol uh, is something that we will be implementing a screening on this sometime in the first half of 2024. So we can leave some contact information for folks that may have some interest in participating or learning more about the trial. And this is um, Doug Falk, he's our CEO. Uh, he would be available uh, for inquiries. And then I can leave my contact information as well. Uh, if patients want to reach out to the company during the screening phase, um, we could answer some questions uh, and potentially direct you towards screening facilities if you have an interest. I'd like to thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. And uh, at Vita, we're very excited to advance what we think is a very novel technology, something that we think can be applied to many different neuromuscular conditions uh, and something that we feel will help patients um, that are in need and, and, and need access to uh, more therapies that will improve their function. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Molyneux. Um, our final speaker for this session is Dr. Andrew Finley from the Washington University in St. Louis. His talk is titled, Therapeutic Approaches for Dominantly Inherited LGMDs. Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Finlay. I'm part of the junior faculty in the Neurofuscal Division at WashU in St. Louis. I'd like to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation to give a talk. Um, so I'd also like to apologize for not being able to be there in person. If anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, so we're gonna be talking about a variety of different therapeutic approaches for dominantly inherited limb girdles. Here are my disclosures. So first, some basics on dominantly inherited limb girdle muscular dystrophy. The dominance refers to the inheritance pattern for this set of disorders. And so for non-sex chromosomes, everyone has two sets of genes. And for a recessive disorder, you have to have two bad copies of a gene in order to cause disease, whereas dominant disorders, it only requires one. I mean, this means that an affected individual is going to have a 50% chance of passing on the bad gene to their children and causing disease. Some rough generalizations can be made about the dominant limb girdles. They occur less frequently, about 10 to 15% of all limb girdles. Um, they have lower CK levels compared to recessive forms. And they're more often adult onset disorders, and their weakness progresses more slowly over time compared to the recessive forms. And because affected individuals usually are in good health at reproductive age, this commonly results in these extensive family trees with many affected individuals, where the disease gets passed down from generation to generation. So this is an example of a family with limb girdle muscular dystrophy type D1, um, where those individuals who are affected are shaded dark. And here's a table summarizing the different dominantly inherited limb girdles using the old and the new nomenclature. So in the prior nomenclature, dominantly inherited subtypes were indicated by a one followed by a letter based on their order of discovery. Um, with the new nomenclature, dominant inheritance is indicated by a D followed by a number. So in this case, LGMD D1. You can see that some of the limb girdles that were part of the old nomenclature are no longer classified as limb girdles. And these Recategorized re disorders can absolutely cause weakness in a limb girdle pattern, uh, but their primary clinical manifestations are, are most commonly something different. So, for example, they cause distal predominant weakness that might affect the hands and feet more so. For the current classification system, dominant limb girdles can be due to mutations in the genes DNAJV6, TNPO3, HNR and PDL. Calpane 3, which can also cause recessive limb girdle, and then the collagen 6A genes. So to understand how to best treat hereditary disorders of muscle, such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy, it's important to first understand the basic hereditary mechanisms underpinning the disease. So starting out with recessive disorders, these require both copies of a gene to be faulty. Um, and having just one bad copy of the gene result in someone being a weird. Um, but not actually having the disease. Uh, recessively inherited limb girls are fairly similar in their disease mechanisms. They're either due to mutations that result in 
absence of the protein or a loss of function of the protein. In contrast, dominantly inherited disorders are caused by at least three different molecular mechanisms. And these mechanistic categories are oversimplifications, but they provide a helpful framework for how to think about dominant disease mechanisms. So the first one is haploinsufficiency, and this refers to disorders where mutations cause only half of the amount of a functional protein to be produced. And this amount of protein is insufficient for normal cellular function. The next one is a toxic or gain of function mechanism. And this results from mutations that either increase the protein's activity, prolong its stability and thereby increase its effect in the cell or cause the protein or RNA to gain some additional toxic function unrelated to its given role. And then lastly is a dominant negative mechanism. And this results from mutations that negate the activity of the functioning protein. And so this mechanism is often seen with proteins that group together to form a complex of proteins. And each protein complex that the mutant protein, or the orange protein in this case, um, is part of is rendered non-functional. There are several categories of gene-based treatment strategies, but the strategy that's optimally suited to treat a specific disease largely depends um, on the disorder's mechanistic category. So for all recessively inherited disorders, Gene replacement therapy, where a new functioning copy of the gene is provided, will in theory be helpful. This approach typically utilizes an adeno-associated virus to deliver a functional version of the gene to a person's cells. Uh, gene therapy can also be helpful in the case of dominant haploinsufficiency disorders, where mutations cause only half of the amount of functional protein to be produced. In contrast, knockdown strategies are ideally suited for treating dominantly inherited disorders that are caused by a toxic or gain of function or a dominant negative mechanism. And, and that being said, um, no therapies or therapeutic clinical trials exist for any of the dominant limb girdles at this point in time. There are several preclinical studies that have been completed investigating treatments in cells and animal models. Um, so there's a, a variety of different knockdown approaches and which is most well suited for a disease really depends on how much of the protein is required for a cell to function normally. So if complete absence of a protein is tolerated, a knockdown approach that targets both copies of a gene or a non-allele specific approach could be beneficial for a dominantly inherited disorder. An example of this is limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 1A, which was reclassified as it more commonly causes a distal myopathy with myofibular pathology. Um, it's an example of a muscle disease with a likely toxic gain of function mechanism caused by mutations in the structural Z-disc protein myotelin. It causes it to misfold and become insoluble and aggregate within muscle. Interestingly, absence of myotelin doesn't appear to cause abnormalities in mouse skeletal muscle. And so this argues against the dominant negative or haploinsufficiency mechanism. And then there's a, a mouse model of LGMD1A that was created by um, overexpressing mutant human myotelin. And this leads to aggregates of myotelin with mid muscle as well as weakness in the mice. Then as a potential therapeutic strategy, Dr. Scott Harper's group at Nationwide Children's Hospital used adeno-associated virus to deliver a microRNA that targets myotelin to knock it down. And this significantly reduced the amount of uh, myotelin levels, it improved muscle pathology, it reduced protein aggregates, and also improved strength in these mice. However, if at least 50% of protein levels are required for cellular health, a knockdown treatment that selectively targets the mutant gene or a allele-specific knockdown could be used. So for example, LGMD D5, this is also known as Bethlehem myopathy, is caused by dominant negative mutations in the collagen-6 genes. Collagen-6 is a key component of the extracellular matrix that surrounds muscle fibers. And these dominant negative mutations disrupt the multimerization of collagen subunits and prevents the formation of these collagen-6 microfibrils. Uh, absence of collagen-6 is also not tolerated, and this is evidenced by recessive loss of function mutations causing the more severe Ulrich's congenital muscular dystrophy. And then selective knockdown of just the mutant allele is an ideal treatment strategy for these dominant collagen-6-related dystrophies as it avoids the potential damaging effects of complete knockdown. 
This approach has been achieved using a variety of different chemistries, including silencing, silencing RNA or siRNA, as well as CRISPR-Cas9, uh, to selectively target the mutant collagen-6 in primary fibroblast cultures from patients, and it was found to improve their collagen-6 extracellular matrix following allele-specific knockdown. Preclinical studies in LGMD D1 provide a related but slightly different therapeutic example involving an isoform specific knockdown approach instead of an allele specific approach. So, LGMD D1 is due to dominantly inherited point mutations in a gene called DNAJB6. This is a chaperone protein. It plays an important role in protein homeostasis by maintaining proteins in their uh, proper shape and preventing them from aggregating. Uh, mutations in DNAJB6 are as I have a dominant effect via toxic gain of function or potentially a dominant negative mechanism. Then muscle biopsies from patients show vacuoles as well as these aggregates and myofibular pathology and this it illustrates DNA JV6's importance in protein homeostasis within muscle. It has two different isoforms. So there's DNA JV6A, which is the larger isoform or a larger version of the protein and it's found mainly within muscle nuclei whereas there's DNA JV6B, the shorter version of the protein or a smaller isoform, and it's localized uh, to myofibular structures in muscle, specifically the Z-disc, which is a, a structural component of muscle. And as shown by these little red asterisks, disease-causing mutations reside within regions of DNA JV6 that are shared by both isoforms. There's several lines of evidence that indicate the B isoform is primarily responsible for disease pathogenesis. This is supported by the fact that the B isoform localizes to the key sites of pathology that we see in human biopsies. And one other important thing is that absence of DNA JB6 is embryonic lethal in mice. What we did instead of developing a global knockdown approach is we developed an approach to selectively knock down the B isoform in myotubes using morpholinos, which are a type of antisense oligonucleotide. And what we found is that selectively reducing DNA JB6B levels in LGMD D1 mouse myotubes, doing this for six days, it resulted in the normalization of some of their disease related abnormalities, specifically a, a proteomic signature, which is a set of proteins whose abundances were altered by DNA JB6 mutations. As these studies were recently completed and haven't been tested in mice yet. Another treatment approach involves complete knockdown of a gene while simultaneously providing a replacement copy of that gene that's resistant to knockdown. And so this strategy uses an adeno-associated virus to deliver the necessary genetic cargo, and by delivering a replacement copy of the gene, it avoids the potentially damaging effects from knockdown, even if over 50% 50, 50 of the protein levels are required. And although it hasn't been tested in any dominant limb girdles, this approach has been found to be beneficial in, in mouse models of several other dominantly inherited neuromuscular disorders, uh, specifically oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. There are many remaining barriers to developing treatments for dominantly inherited limb girdles when compared to their recessive counterparts. And again, more research needs to be done to categorize the complex heterogeneous disease mechanisms for each dominant limb girdle. And this is a requirement before even being able to conceptualize a therapy. Additionally, the various knockdown approaches are not nearly as developed compared to the gene replacement therapies used for recessive limb girdles. These knockdown approaches require um, additional research, especially in the area of therapeutic delivery to muscle. And even if a promising therapy was suddenly available, the natural history of disease progression for dominantly inherited limb girdles really aren't all that well characterized yet. Uh, characterizing the natural history of disease progression is really important in order to identify ideal outcome measures for future therapeutic trials. Um, we started to do some research in this area by conducting a preliminary natural history study in LGMD D1. And so through this work, we found that different disease causing mutations are associated with variable ages of onset. We also found that Various mutations that cause disease are associated with different weakness patterns, where some people had uh, distal predominant weakness affecting their hands and feet, whereas others had a more typical limb girdle pattern of weakness. And then we also found that certain mutations are associated with different rates of disease progression, where certain individuals progress much more quickly to using a wheelchair, whereas others progress much more slowly. 
And then overall, this variability in individuals with LGMD D1 really highlights the importance of connecting with and identifying as many individuals with dominantly inherited limb girdles as possible, as these future clinical trials are going to require really high rates of participation to combat not only this variability in disease severity, but also the rarity of these disorders. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks.